The Setup. Lesson 1. Get in the habit. Greeting cyber students, Mr. Reed here, and this is the first in what will hopefully be a long line of audio downloads for you to use. Notice I say, hopefully. That's because I'm standing inside of a high-tech recording booth of a major radio company. I'm not paying for the usage, nor are they allowing me to do this as a favor. They're under the belief that I'm an electrician who's been taking an inordinately long time to change a light bulb. After recording the first lesson of this, I'm going to go back outside and tell them that there's a problem with the fixture itself. Then I'm going to tell them it needs some more work and record lesson two. By the time it comes to record lesson three, I'm hoping that they will have moved on to other duties in their workday and will have simply forgotten that I was in the booth. Around the time it takes to record lesson four, I will probably have to operate a screwdriver of sorts to make it look convincing, and eventually I'll make my escape. Now, there are a lot of these lessons that I'm going to be recording, and far more than I could finish in a single recording session. So I'm going to have to come back multiple days with multiple excuses for why I need to be inside of the recording booth. My plan is tomorrow to have fashioned a crude mustache of sorts to wear as a disguise. I'm hoping that this will work effectively on top of my own mustache and that try as they might to not be distracted, it will become difficult to not be confused and disoriented by what I like to refer to as double mustache confusion. This particular series of lessons is here introduced to act as a supplement, a backup, to the lessons that you will learn in the classroom during my senior applications course at West Monroe High School. Notice that I said they are to supplement. These audio lessons are not meant in any way whatsoever ever to take the place of your reading, your homework, your test, your lessons, or any other assignments. If all you're doing is listening to the lessons and hoping to do well in class, well, I'll see you your next senior year. As mentioned in class, senior applications in English is unlike any other course that you've probably taken before. It's what used to be business English, but it's been modified to cover a much, much wider range of topics. The first section of this class will mainly cover topics discussed in Sean Covey's book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective Teens. Periodically, lessons will branch away from this book to cover other things that tie in to what we're doing in class. Later in the school year, you can expect more of a concentration on a business English format, and then finally we'll be covering literature with works like Lord of the Flies. Fun stuff for everybody. Let's look first to the seven habits of highly effective teens. You may be asking yourself, why for this class did we choose this book? Well, this particular text focuses on the unique problems of being a teenager. And yes, I said there are some unique problems in being a teenager. True, I'm a retired teenager, and so I know a lot of the same things that you're going through, but at the same time, there are some issues that perhaps you're dealing with that others have not before. See, the problem is, old people like to give phrases such as, well, Back in my day, teenagers had it tough. In those days, we had to walk uphill to go to school, both ways, in the middle of the snow. Well, I remember a day when I was rocking to school, and the wolves got in after us. Now, as you know about wolves, they'll chase you hither and yon, and yon and hither, just a-snapping and snipping at your heels. And the only place we could go to was school, and, well, we got there, and we realized it was a Saturday. But luckily, the teacher was there and gave us lessons anyway, and so that's how we defeated the wolves. <coughs> uh, what? Uh, oh, yes. Uh... My question has always been, if the good old days were so incredibly hard and difficult, then why the heck were they called the good old days? But I digress. A lot of times they follow up statements like that with statements that are kind of of the effect of, My teenagers today, they don't know what it's like to have difficulty in their lives. They don't know what it's like to face real problems, to put up with the things that we put up with. Why, back in my day, I remember... Okay, that's when... enough, that's enough. Let's stop now. It's time to take your medicine, Mr. Johnson. Well, but I don't like those pills. I'll break them up and put them in applesauce for you. Oh, yay. Now, this approach of teenagers not facing problems, that's a fallacy. Teenagers have problems. Teenagers have a lot of issues that kids way back when 
didn't have to deal with. Sure, there are some exceptions. And yes, there are some instances where teenagers don't know what it's like to have to live with the same kinds of difficulties. But that's not the same as teenagers not understanding what difficulty is or what hard times really are in their lives. For example, more and more as a teacher, I see students coming to me saying things like, I can just never find enough time in my day. There's homework. There are my friends to deal with. There's a boyfriend or girlfriend in the picture. My family is going through a lot of difficulty right now. There is a job. All kinds of things really are messing me over here. How about this? How common is it now for one teenager in the household to be the breadwinner of the family? Sometimes maybe not the breadwinner, but how about this? The babysitter taking care of their siblings while mom and dad work. How about us living in a society that's constantly reminding our teenagers of how they look, that they need to be obsessed with being thin, with wearing the right clothes, with hanging out with the right people, and on and on. How about family life being a disaster? No one sits around the dinner table anymore. No one takes time to enjoy the little things in life. There's the pressure of conditions like depression, feelings of hopelessness, the pressures of trying to get into a college, drugs, sex, and other things that they don't want a public school teacher to bring up on an audio lesson. <sighs> All right. Sorry. Got a little out of hand there. I'm fine. I'm perfectly okay. My point is these problems are real and not only are they real, but they've gotten to a point where they're not just occasional problems. No, these are problems that fit you in your everyday life now as a teenager. That is a tough situation and there's no on off switch for these. And you know that running away from the issue doesn't work. We have to solve the problems or at least meet them head on and tackle them in new and creative ways. That's why Sean Covey wrote the book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective Teens, to come up with ways that teenagers can face the issues going on in their lives, not only be happier, but to be maybe healthier, to be maybe more successful in everything that they do. We're talking about life betterment, people. And you're getting this from a book being taught to you from a classroom and being discussed online in an audio recording? with a teacher playing ninja in a radio booth? Hey, whatever works. Now you may be asking yourself, okay, what are these seven habits of highly effective teens? Let's begin, Johnny. Habit one, be proactive. Being proactive is simple. What is proactive? If you answered that it's the acne cream they have for sale at the kiosk in the mall, congratulations on your clearer complexion, but no, you're wrong. Being proactive simply means taking responsibility for your life and for your actions. You're the one in charge of what it is that you do. To a point, but we'll discuss more on that later. Habit two, begin with the end in mind. Beginning with the end in mind simply means defining your mission and your goals in life. What is it that you want to do? Simple as that. What is it that you want to do? Habit three, put first things first. Okay, well, you've identified what it is that you want to do in life. Well, how do you get there? That takes prioritizing and doing the most important things first. Habit four, protect your feet. That is in no way one of the seven habits of highly effective teens. Are you sure? Yes. As a matter of fact, I'm pretty confident that that's a line from Forrest Gump. I loved that movie. Read the script or I will cut you with a pencil sharpener. Habit four. Think win-win. Win-win means that everyone can win. Simple as that. We don't often think of things that way. We think in terms of win-lose, but there are ways that everybody can come out on top, and we're going to discuss those in these lessons. Habit five, seek first to understand, then be understood. It's a simple prospect. If you want somebody to understand you, you probably need to try to understand them first. Key to that, listen before you talk. Habit six, synergize. Despite sounding like a cheesy workout video, synergizing has a great purpose, and that's simply working together to achieve more than you could on your own. And finally, number seven, habit seven, sharpen the saw. This isn't shop class, but we are going to sharpen the saw. Not literally, but we're going to find out ways to renew ourselves regularly. That way we have enough energy and enough drive to go out and do all the things that we need to do once again. 
Now, these seven habits are in order, number one through seven, and it's very important that the order is understood. You see, being proactive is one of the most basic things you can be. All the other habits grow up from this. You can almost think of this like a tree. You start out with being proactive as the root. Beginning with the end in mind starts to come up a little bit up out of the ground. Putting first things first, you start building the trunk of the tree. Thinking win-win, we've got a good solid round tree here. Now we are beginning to seek first to understand, then to be understood as the branches start to move out. We start getting leaves on our tree with synergizing and finally to top it all off you've got sharpen the saw and that's fueling the tree through sunlight, through rain, through all the things that you need to make that tree grow. I don't want to confuse anybody with the tree analogy. I just want you to remember that these are in order for a reason, and it's not always best to just skip one and jump to the next one. They build on top of each other. Not only do they build on top of each other, but we can also break them up into groups. The first three habits we can refer to as the private victory, meaning that they take place within yourself. The next three habits take place with the public victory. In other words, outside of you, dealing with other people. The final habit kind of stands by itself, renewal, refreshing everything that came before so you can do it all over again. Now, maybe you're new to setting habits, or you at least think you're new to setting habits. But what is a habit, really? It's actually pretty simple. A habit is simply something that you do over and over again, a lot of times without thinking. Some habits are great, like exercising regularly, planning ahead, showing respect for other people. Some are bad, like thinking negatively all the time feeling inferior to others, or blaming other people for your mistakes, your problems, and your difficulties. And some habits that you do really don't matter, like taking showers at night instead of in the morning, reading magazines from back to front, or eating yogurt with a fork. Weirdo! But depending on whatever they are, habits can either make us or they can break us. Because you do become what you repeatedly do. But the thing about these habits, even though they make up who we are, we're not wholly beholden to them. We don't have to continually be slaves to our habits because we can change them. Anytime you're able to look at a mirror and say, I don't like X, Y, or Z about myself, guess what? We can change out X, Y, or Z and put in A, B, or C. And you can always exchange a bad habit for a better one. I'm not saying it's always going to be easy, but it can definitely be worth it. Now, these seven habits that we're going to be discussing, they can help you do a lot of things. They can help you get control of your life, improve your relationships with your friends, help you make smarter decisions, uh. help you get along with your parents, help you even overcome addiction. I've had several students do that. The kinds of things we're going to cover will help you define your values and what matters most to you. It's going to help you get more done in less time, increase your self-confidence, to be happy, and to even find a balance between school, work, friends, and everything else that's going on in your life. You might not always think that everything we talk about is exactly fitting your circumstance. But we'll be talking about enough different things that you will be able to find some stuff that pertains to you and hopefully some things that entertain you along the way. Now, the whole reason why we're covering this isn't so you just have something to kill time. It's not so you can just sit in my class and try to make a passing grade. We're going through these things so you can make life changes where you need to make the changes. And anybody can do them. Because if I can do it, I know you can too. And you might be asking, well, who are you to tell me these things? Who am I? I'm a 29-year-old father of two with a mighty beard and a pretty good enjoyment of video games. I've not caught all 151 Pokemon, but hey, all these years later, I'm still trying. And yes, there are 151. I don't care. Once you start going beyond Mew, you're getting a little ridiculous. If I were a real Pokemon trainer and someone threw out a number 152 or higher, I would probably just forget the Pokemon battle and tackle the person's Pokemon myself. I'm confident I could fight hard enough to win the battle but mostly because of double mustache confusion. Class dismissed. Come on!